Thank you everyone for joining us. I wanna start first with our land acknowledgement. Um, the Utah Museum of Contemporary Art sits on the unceded homelands of the Goshu, Shoshone, Paiute, and Ute peoples. And we acknowledge their traditions and contemporary stewardship of the land and recognize the painful influences of colonization that continue to affect and exploit native homelands and people. Um, I also wanted to thank our exhibition sponsors, Bonnie and Lee Kirkpatrick and Visit Salt Lake, uh, as well as Zap Tax and the, the residents of Salt Lake County for funding our uh, organization. And I wanted to thank our town hall sponsors, BYU Arts Department and Utah State uh, University Department of Art History. If you're from any, if you're students from any of these organizations, if you want to heart your um, your um, send a heart emoji so we can shout you all out and, and see all of you uh, welcome. Um, and welcome uh, 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 Umoka uh, supporters. We're so honored and excited to have you all here. Um, I wanna start with introducing our wonderful panelists and, and just shout out the Four Freedoms team. I have been so honored and excited to uh, participate with Four Freedoms since uh, going to the Four Freedoms Congress in uh, February of 2020 and have just caught the vision of, um, of change and um, uh, of, of being visionary and not reactionary that they uh, that they uh, celebrate um, and uh, and so honored to introduce our panelists today. So we have Claudia uh, Pena. She is an artist and the Four Freedoms Executive Director. She's also a lawyer and, and teaches at um, UCLA. Uh, we also have Autumn Brian. Uh, she's an artist and curator and just did this amazing performance uh, for Freeze LA. Uh, we have uh, Brian. Um, oh, Brian, I don't. I I deleted your last name. It's it's. Is it Brian? Can it's you? Brian Bain. Bain. Oh yeah, my I... gosh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Brian Bain, uh, artist, activist, scholar. Thank you so much for being on our panel. And then Mateo Ochada, uh, artist, senior manager and of community programming at the Sundance Institute. Thank you all for joining us and for being a part of this very important town hall today. Um, I want to turn the rest of the time over to Claudia. Thank you so much for that, Laura. And thanks y'all for being here. We're excited to be spending this Thursday evening with you. Um, as this is a town hall, it's really important for people to be able to interact and for folks not to get talked at, but for us all to be in a dialogue together um, and to be able to interact. So the we're gonna start off with the artists presenting some version of what they're working on. Um, and then we're gonna have a little bit of a discussion and then we're gonna have provoke y'all to have some discussion with each other as well, perhaps in breakout rooms, um, depending on how it goes. And then we'll reconvene. Because we decided to have this in a meeting format as opposed to a webinar, um, Maybe you enjoy watching people speak while everybody while you can see everybody else. If you actually want to see the speaker who is speaking, you can also put it on speaker view. I'm sure that you know this already. And we'll be pinning folks as we see fit as well. But let's jump into it. We are talking about many different topics tonight. Um, and we're gonna start off with um, I think Mateo, right? Mateo, can we start off with you? And would you like to say a few words before we share anything of yours? Yes, absolutely. Hey, y'all. Thanks for coming through today. Um, again, my name is Mateo Ochoa. I use they, them pronouns. Um, and so what I'm going to be sharing today, it's not a piece that I've created, rather a piece that's informed how I approach my work. Uh, as Laura mentioned earlier, I'm an art organizer. And I, really I work at Fundance Institute. And so I'm showing a piece created by Daddy's Plastic which is an arts collective that's turned into a music group based in Oakland. Uh, Oakland is a huge home of mine for me. And so this piece really uh, encapsulates the, the passion and importance of critique, especially when it comes to gentrification and displacement of our communities. And so one thing that I really appreciate about this piece is how fun and ener um, energetic this, this group is. And although we're constantly pigeonholed into a moment of crises or moments of feeling as if we should always be experiencing trauma porn. This piece is a critique of that, but also as a way to have fun with play. Um, so I figured we just start off with that and then we'll come back to it a little bit later once we, we get together and talk.
tag me in that pic. Silicone, Silicone, Silicone Valley. Valley, Silicone, Silicone Valley. Hey girl, did you get that eviction notice? Google, Google apps, apps. Google, Google apps, apps. Gringa, gringa apps, apps. I just wanna wanna be white. Google, Google apps, apps. Okay, Mattel, tell us about it. Yes, um, so this piece was created in 2013, I believe, and was showcased in 2016. At, well, this is where I first was introduced to this piece. Uh, Take This Hammer, it's an art and media activist exhibition that took place at Yerba Buena Art Center in San Francisco. And so the criticism is pretty clear. It's just talking about how a lot of black and brown folks, queer and trans folks in the Bay Area, in this case, focusing on San Francisco have been displaced. A lot of it, it's been as a result of these tech companies moving in. A lot of this is because folks are moving into the space because they can afford it. Um, but the reason I put this one in is because a lot of the work that I've been doing is I'm very, very cognizant of gentrification and art is not uh, exempt from that, unfortunately. We see this happening in Boyle Heights where a lot of folks who are artists that weren't born and raised there are moving into that area. And unfortunately that leads to a lot of implications of increasing housing market in that region. So a lot of folks are having to leave. And so what's really important about this piece is moving forward, what I typically do with my organizing work is I lean to the folks that already live in these places. I primarily work with films now. And the moment you just go into a neighborhood and just provide an organize an event, we're doing something wrong. We got to lean onto the artists that have been living in these places, have been doing the work, have been sustaining their communities and providing the material if they seek it and if they want it. And so with this piece, that's just something that I really took personally and I've continued to bring with me throughout my work. Um, it's fun, it's silly, but it's also very real. A lot of artists have been struggling. A lot of families who are not artists have been struggling. And so what are, so what are some things that art can use to make sure that we minimize and if anything, eradicate displacement and ensure that our communities are really safe and safeguarded? Thank you, Mateo. All right, given that um, this is, uh, this town hall is connected to the awakening exhibit that's up at UMOCA right now. And so there's a lot of different ways to be thinking about awakening, right? Mateo just gave us one. And Autumn, you are up next. And I can't wait to see what you have for us. Thank you, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. I am going to share 
a video from my recent performance. Should I share my screen? I'm happy to do it. When you are you ready now? Yeah, yeah, I'm ready. All we right. Can just start with the video and then talk about it after. Perfect. We have just arrived after journeying through space and time for the revered ritual of reclaimed time. We've been dis receiving distress signals from the black women of your city and chose this day to return to your coordinates. If this is your first time participating in the ritual of reclaimed time, there is no need for apprehension. I would travel the world and wander, marvel at the ease that life holds, eat quality food that nourishes my body. I would relish the pamper, revel in the carefree dance in the street and skate every corner of the globe. Thanks. So that, that video is an excerpt of a recent guerrilla performance piece that I did on the steps of the Walt Disney Concert Hall in downtown Los Angeles. And the piece is called Don't Use Me. So I, I did some, some research uh, around the, the pay equity gap. And that's something that a lot of my, my creative practices related to uh, abolition, womanism, and especially black women's labor. So I knew that black women were paid approximately 63 cents on the dollar, but I wanted to understand that in terms of time. So if we use that same data, it takes a black woman on average eight months into the following year to earn what a white man earned in 365 days. That blew my mind and I immediately started wondering what I would do with an extra eight months of time. But as soon as I started thinking about it, I knew that I had to ask other black women the same question. So I created a very simple survey, asked black women what they would do with eight months of paid time and received so many responses. And with each response, I folded it into a paper flower and wore that in the massive fro that I was wearing during that performance. And I constructed a palanquin and was carried to the Walt Disney Concert Hall steps. And the public was invited to approach me remove a flower from my hair. And that was what you saw me handing back to Yasmin Monet Watkins, the poet that was behind me. And she read each response out loud. Um, it, it was really interesting when the public heard those responses, some of the black women that were in the audience had shared their reclamation of time. So many of those answers were so universal that many black women thought that other people's responses were their own. Uh, the, the most frequent response that I got was that black women would rest. They would take time to be still. Folks also said they would explore another degree. They would finish a book that they always wanted to read. Really simple things that we, that we take for granted when we think about time and labor. Um, so the, the piece has continued. The performance was during freeze, but I minted my first NFT on International Women's Day this week. And it's the kickoff for a series where every week I will be staging a portrait of myself where I will be um, basically performing and personifying how a black woman said she would reclaim her time. And that black woman that wrote down those words will be written as a co-creator so that uh, it's a direct action against pay inequity. That black woman will be uh, basically invited to share in profits in perpetuity and the permanent ledger will show uh, when that black woman shared her response and how many other people decide to read it, decide to share it. So it was a, a really interesting way to leverage radical spectacle, but also technology um, in a direct action against pay inequity. Thank you, Autumn. That Thank piece you. is beautiful, for sure. Okay, up next. We have Brian Bain. Let me pin you. And would you like to say anything or should we show your video? Uh, maybe I should say something. Peace and blessings, family. I'm Brian Bain. And um, we're going to look at a video 
that brings together uh, nine years, the last nine years of my work in prisons around the country. I've been doing work in prisons for a little over 30 years, believe it or not, first as an artist, then as an activist, and now as an artist, activist, and educator. And uh, this <clears throat> piece is a 60 second video that brings together a project called Rebel Speak, a Justice Movement Mixtape. It's a literary mixtape because it's a collection of both essays and interviews, uh, oral history style interviews with uh, some of the most radical visionaries thinking about justice on the planet. Uh, and it was inspired by the first conversation I had nine years ago with both Dolores Huerta and Harry Belafonte, um, where I had both of them in conversation and they literally you know, ripped the Ford Foundation in half at the Ford Foundation. And the book is about centering the voices of people who are system impacted, who are incarcerated and formerly incarcerated in the conversation about how to imagine justice, right? Um, and so I'll talk a little more about it after we watch it, but this is just a glimpse of what the book includes. Selecta, when you're ready. I'm ready. Come down. <laughs> How do I make it full view? Here we go. What do you mean when you say I'm rebellious? I don't accept everything that you're telling us. What are you selling us? The creator dwelling us. I sit in your whack ass class and you're failing us. Failed your class cause I ain't with your reason. Trying to make me you by seasoning up my mind, but you can't have mine. See, I shame the devil with the bass and the treble. Bang heads like heavy metal. Take them to another level. I'm a rebel, so I rebel. Ain't hard to tell. For I live on my knees, I will die on my feet. Rebel speed, rebel speed, rebel speed, rebel speed, rebel speed, rebel speed. Rebel speed, rebel speed, rebel speed. Mixtape circulates in ways that's not always tangible, but the people who get it know what they have. <clears throat> so that is the uh, trailer directed by Claudia Peña herself. She was in the mix. I dragged her in to be involved in the creative process. And it includes uh, some of the folks, uh, some of the less well-known folks are uh, Albert Woodfox, one of the Angola Three, who was incarcerated for 44 years in a six by nine box in the Angola State Penitentiary. Uh, so named, largest prison in the country, so named because it was the site of four different slave plantations. And basically at the end of the Civil War, uh, when uh, we were so-called emancipated, they basically changed the sign on the door. And instead of Angola State Pen Plantation, it became Angola State Penitentiary, which is a powerful metaphor for the relationship between uh, prisons and plantation slavery, right? Uh, the native genocide is the first site of uh, mass incarceration in this country, but the incarceration of indigenous folks uh, followed by the, the incarceration of African folks, of Asian American folks, is all part of that trajectory. And now poor and working class white folks. And so uh, the book is 10 chapters that are tracks in the way that you put together a mixtape. For some of y'all who may not remember the days when we used to put a pop a cassette in and uh, press rewind, the beautiful thing about a mixtape, you put together all the songs that you love the most for somebody who's important to you and your favorite songs are so good, they got to hit rewind at the end, go back to the beginning and just play it all over again. And so I hope this book, by drawing on that spirit of that tradition, uh, brings some of that to the fore. I can't imagine having a movement for, uh, for, for Black liberation that was run by white folks. I can't imagine having a movement for women's liberation, a feminist, a womanist movement that's led by men. I can't imagine a queer movement led by straight folks. So why would we have a movement to end mass incarceration, an abolitionist movement that doesn't include people who are incarcerated or formerly incarcerated in the leadership of that movement? And so this book centers folks who are system impacted, centers folks who we call credible messengers to make sure that our voices are at the center of the discussion about the future of justice in this country and around the world. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. So you're making people all riled up already. <laughs> Just how you do.
All right, now it is my turn. So as um, Laura mentioned, I am the executive director for Four Freedoms, and we are a collective of artists uh, that the organization was born about six years ago or so. Um, and it was it started off as an artist performance as a super PAC. It was started by Hank Willis Thomas, Eric Gottesman, Wyatt Gallery, and Michelle Wu, and the four of them were crazy enough to start a super PAC. They actually called me because I'm also a lawyer and they were like, hey, do you think we should do this? And I was like, definitely not. That is a terrible idea. Y'all don't know what you're doing, <laughs> artists. This is messy. And they were like, cool, cool. We're going to go do it. So they did. <laughs> and I'm glad they didn't listen to me at least that one time. <laughs> um, and then the, it, the organization took shape. It's no longer a super PAC. Um, we now function in a hybrid way. And over the years, I uh, collaborated many times on some of the projects that Four Freedoms did, including the Norman Walkwell photos that we redid in 2018 and the first 50 state initiative where we put billboards in every single state, including Puerto Rico and DC. Um, and then they finally convinced me to come on and join the craziness. So I've been serving as executive director for, I don't know how long, summer of 2020. And uh, that fall was when we started the awakening campaign, which was in collaboration and in parallel to the Wide Awakes. For those of you who haven't heard, the Wide Awakes were um, a group of abolitionists and in the 1800s. So the abolition they were talking about was slavery. And many of them were feminists. They wanted women to have the right to vote. Um, and many of them talked about being anti-capitalist. So the original Wide Awakes of the 1800s inspired a group of folks, a group of artists um, in early 2020 before the pandemic hit at the Four Freedoms Congress was sort of the unveiling of this group of artists that wanted to come together in a collective to have um, no centralized leadership. So to me, it's the original DAO, the original decentralized autonomous organization. Um, and it was a very sort of leaderful space where people's ideas were welcomed as long as you were willing to do it, uh, there was a space for it. And it was also sort of an open source space where people were encouraged to build on each other's work and ideas and to add and to show up and to support and to be allies. And so that work continues, the Wide Awakes continue to inspire people. Autumn is a Wide Awakes artist. Brian is a Wide Awakes artist. Mateo, I'm just going to claim it. Um, and one of the one of the things that Four Freedoms did, Four Freedoms also sees itself as one of the wide awakes as an organization and as individuals. Um, so we created what we call the Infinite Playbook. And this year we're going to have an infinite atlas, but it wasn't quite ready to share. So I'm going to go ahead and share the Infinite Playbook with you, just some pieces of it. And Mateo, Autumn, and Brian, are you all okay with reading out loud? Well, you cool. Okay, so I'm going to call on you to help me read some of this stuff because nobody wants to hear one person's voice all the time. That's boring. Okay, so I'm not going to show you the whole thing because it's kind of longish, but as you can see, this is, we, we're having lots of discussions between, I mean, around the conversation, what does it mean to be woke versus awake? What's the difference between those two? And where do you fall in? What inspires you? What's more meaningful to you? What resonates with you? Um, and so, um, as you can see down, down here, currently assembling in the world, <laughs> we're just claiming it sort of all over the world. Um, and we'll skip through these. The idea behind the way that we entered the wide awake space is we wanted to encourage people to think about play and to stay in their imagination. We believe that if everybody shows up as an artist, whether that's what you do to make your money or you're a researcher or you're a mathematician or a scientist, if you show up as an artist scientist, then there's no limits to what's possible, right? Then you're boundless in all of the possibilities that exist in this universe. If people continue to tap into the artists in them, no matter what that looks like, then your imagination is wide open. If we're stuck with what we already know exists, then we're never gonna get any better than where we are right now, right? So we believe that if everybody taps into the artists that they are and lean into play, that we might see some exciting changes and possibilities. So uh, we were leaning into what's called the infinite game, 
Uh, and here are some of the rules according to us. And we always encourage other people to make up your own rules, use these, build on them, change them, edit them, claim them as your own, whatever, all of it is welcome. So these are some of the rules. Um, Mateo, can I have you read the full box titled number one? Of course. Uh, this is Mateo. Number one is no one plays alone. You know nothing you need to know. The rules always change and love overrules. Sit with that for a sec. Autumn, can you read number two? There are no gatekeepers. Bring people into play. Be where you are. Carry your own trash. Sit with that. What does carry your own trash mean? Okay, Brian, can you read number three, please? <laughs> you looking for your mute button? <laughs> you can't find our tab anymore. <laughs> okay, you look for the tab while I read three, and when you find it, you can read four. Number three, learn from feeling. Let love quiet fear. Nourish joy. Go there. <clears throat> Brian, you want to read four? You're just in time. Leap before you look. You know everything you need to know. Together, we are awake. Blah, blah, blah. And seriously, don't take yourself too seriously. <laughs> play on, playa. I knew you were looking for a character when you hesitated to start reading. I was like, I know exactly what he's doing. I was, I was looking for a mute button. <laughs> <laughs> After you got off mute, you still hesitate. As you can see, Brian is also an actor. <laughs> he's a performer in all the ways. Um, okay, so these rules, they're kind of, you know, in some ways they're a little bit quaint um, and in some ways are very aspirational, but what's most important to us is they're open to interpretation, right? Because we're artists and we want to provoke thought. We want to provoke questions. We want to provoke dialogue. So this isn't necessarily giving you all the answers. For example, you need, you know, nothing you need to know and you know everything you need to know. What the hell does that mean? I don't know. You tell me, right? So we want you to be thinking about these things and determine for yourself. Um, well, how this lands for you, what this means for you. I'll stop there and unpin myself. Now, having looked at just a few minutes or having heard from each other for just a few minutes, each of you, you know, does so many things in your life and there's so much that informs your work. Um, so we only got a glimpse of a few minutes. Let's have a little bit of a discussion so we can peel off more layers of the onion. Uh, and then we can invite some of the participants to also ask questions. Who's going to start us off? I think I will. <laughs> um, and my question is um, for Brian. Brian, ob obviously writing is an art form. So you've you've put together this book which is also a compilation of interviews, but your writing is in there. That is a very obvious form of art. How else do you think of your book, Rebel Speak, as like an art piece? It's a great question. So a couple of very simple ways. Um, I had uh, an art student uh, come to me about two years ago, a uh, really brilliant illustrator, uh, digital artist named Blaise Bautista. And she came to me and said, you know, I really want to do some work in the prisons using art. And uh, I'm a little frustrated because of my art program, they say my work is too political. She was doing images of Derek Chauvin and other police who had killed black and brown folks and like showing their faces kind of half distorted to kind of reflect the ugliness and pain and trauma they caused on people and the other half kind of regular. And the whole art department was like, I don't know, it's a little bit too aggressive, it's a little bit too angry, it's a little bit too emotional, militant, all these horrible things. And when I saw her work, I was like, oh, hell no, we need to support this as much as possible. So I commissioned her to do all the art in the book. 
And so she graduates, I think, in a couple of weeks. But her art is already published in this book, which comes out May 19th, Malcolm X's birthday. It's all you can pre-order it now. I got to say that. Um, but, you know, she's in the book and Angela Davis wrote the foreword. So I was like, I wish when I was 22 years old, somebody put my artwork in their book with Angela Davis writing the foreword. And, you know, so so it's definitely art in that sense. She did a really brilliant job of just doing digital illustrations of Dolores with uh, Harry Belafonte, of Albert Bufax, of Susan Burton. 21st century Harriet Tubman, you know, help women get out of get out of prison in California and South Central Los Angeles and, you know, get their lives on track, you know, beautiful images of all these folks. So that's a way it's an art piece. But I also, you know, think about just the way in which the chapters, which we call tracks, the way they connect with each other. You know, Angela writes this really beautiful thing in the four where she talks about there's even one sort of very unlikely track with somebody you wouldn't think of as a rebel, but it's the ward in the Sing Sing prison. You know, the warden of Sing Sing prison, I interviewed him because he testified against one of his guards who had brutalized some, an incarcerated man in the prison. And he got a lot of backlash for that. I said, well, I need to talk to you about that, you know, because other wardens need to actually come to the defense of folks who are brutalizing their prisons too. And so that was an unlikely thing. But in a mixtape, you might have some things that you know, kind of go off the beaten path a little bit, right? You know, you might have some, some, some things that are in there that aren't, you know, you, I might have back to back Nina Simone and, and Bessie Smith and Gertrude Rainey, but I might go in a whole nother direction and throw Bob Marley in there. We're going over the Caribbean a little bit, you know? So, so I think having these sort of turns, having the structure, the form of a mixtape, which is, you know, that's like, that's, that's, that's as, as community oriented art as you can get, you know, um, you know, it's, it's having access to that as a form and bringing that into this, this literary realm was a part of it. And then lastly, you know, oral histories are art, you know, Malcolm X's autobiography, right, is, is an oral history project. He's, he's meeting with Alex Haley, you know, a couple of nights a week, to tell his story in, in Greenwich Village in New York City. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll definitely put a name in the chat. I just saw that. Thank you. Um, and so that oral history, the, the relationship between two people in dialogue and conversation, that's in the book. But all of these conversations are then annotated because I wanted to give context. So there's sources, but we don't put the sources, the sources that would normally be the centerpiece of a law journal article or a social science article, they're now the sidelines. So we bring folks who are normally marginalized to the center and we put on the margins, the academic sources and citations and the blue book references that are oftentimes in the articles. So we center the, those, those voices. And so we're borrowing from other artistic media, you know, to actually deliver these stories to the world, very much in the spirit of the class that we taught together at Victorville Federal Prison to women incarcerated there, a class called Justice by Any Media Necessary. And so that's that, those are some of the ways that I think of it as an art piece. Thank you, and completely agreed. Will you share your Spotify playlist with us? I will. There's a song uh, linked to every track, every track in the book, and I'll link that in just a moment so y'all can check it out. And uh, we're going to do a follow up. I'm thinking we'll do that's volume one. Volume two will be a collaborative piece and maybe we'll make it we'll name it after this Utah, you know, gathering. So everybody can add to the playlist, you know, what you think connects with some of these issues as well. So I'll grab that in a moment. Brilliant. Thank you. Rian? Yes. Sorry, I was looking for the uh, the playlist. Oh, okay, I'll do that. Okay. Um, was there a follow up? <laughs> <laughs> um, I put Blaze's name in in the chat already, but I think uh, does Blaze have a website? I can't remember. Um, if mm, not last time I checked. Yeah, I don't think that she does yet. Yeah. But she's probably on Instagram, and Brian and I are the worst on that. But there are people here that can find her I'm sure <laughs> yeah definitely on Instagram <laughs> okay all right cool and then I'm gonna put um the Spotify playlist that I have I think is the one for like that it comes with that is supposed to be for the book and then we're gonna try to create a, a more collaborative one yes Brian, you ready uh, yes, what is next? I, I got caught off guard looking for this Spotify playlist. <laughs> yeah, you're so, asking uh, Autumn a question. Okay, got it. Awesome. Um, so I'm really curious, Autumn, 
uh, to to know like what was the most surprising response? I was really pleased to see black women would choose rest in your in your piece. You know, definitely, you know, the distress signals um, grabbed my attention. The relish in the pamper grabbed my attention um, in the don't use me uh, piece. But I really want to know, given your the, how deep you've gone into this work. Like what was, is there, are there any examples or at least one example of something that was really surprising or unexpected to you in the kinds of responses that you received in your process? Yeah, yeah, uh, that's a great question. And I was also very pleased to see that a lot of folks said that they would rest mm -hmm. because I'm very inspired by Trisha Hersey's uh, practice. She is the Nat Bishop and founder of the Knapp Ministry. And she's a performance artist. Um, she's a writer. Uh, her, her entire practice is centered in rest as resistance. And it's a, a resistance against white supremacy, a resistance against capitalism. And it, it inspires me so much. I'm always encouraging folks to rest. And I love seeing that Black women say, would say that they would, would rest with their time. Mm -hmm. But a response that surprised me one person said that with more time and with the money that came with that time that they would just finally get their wisdom teeth taken care of wow they said that they had been uh, complaining about like dental pain for years not for weeks or months but for years mm. and and it really just got me thinking about how intertwined many of the problems are that we face as a society because we, we know about um about black maternal health we know about how high death rates are for black mothers for black babies we know about um high blood pressure all of these other ailments that, that really plague our community and what i thought about was how many women would just have time to get a physical or to pay more attention to that nagging pain that they may have had in their entire body. And what so many physicians say is that, especially with cancer, for example, my partner is a cancer researcher. Mm. The, the biggest thing that physicians want is early detection so that they have time to treat ailments. Mm -hmm. So if as a black woman, you are born behind the clock, mm -hmm. if you have less time just by being born black, the right. pay inequity for Black women starts on average at 16 years old. So if you started working and you lost time, you, you lost time to rest, you lost time to vacation, but you also lost time to take care of this physical shell that we have as humans. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, uh, that one really stuck with me. I, I think about that one a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I don't know if it surprised me because it made so much sense mm -hmm. when I read it. I have right. heard other people say that they just need time to, to make a doctor's appointment, it, it, you know? So I, I don't know if surprise is the, well, the right word, but that, that really stuck with me. It, it definitely mm -hmm. stuck with me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Adam, am I allowed to respond? I just, so many thoughts. And, Please you do. Know, yeah, I just, all right, cool. I guess, you know, my partner is also in medicine, right? And oh, actually, really? Yeah, and most... <laughs> Um, most of most of the black women, most of the women in my family are black women who are healers of some kind. Yeah. You know, um, and so I know because of that, because of them, the number one place that black folks get health care in this country is in the emergency room. Yeah. The emergency room, because we have all these other blocks and barriers. And we know the story from Billy Holiday's father dying because they wouldn't treat him because yeah. the white hospital was close and the black hospital was far and he died before he could get treated. Like that's a powerful metaphor for what our experiences is in, you know, in mass. And so, and because black women are, are stepping up into the position of being the healers and the caretakers more often than anybody else in, in many yeah. of our communities, what ends up happening is they take care of themselves less yeah. and take care of everybody else more, right? Yeah. So I think it, it, it inspires in me the thought that we have to figure out how uh, those of us who have greater privilege can operationalize that privilege to bring equity where these inequities you're pointing out are so, uh, so vast. Yeah, yeah, and, and Black women as caregivers, unfortunately and fortunately, that's a function of adaptation. Mm -hmm. I, 
I, I wonder if many black women that are caregivers would choose to do so if they did not have to, mm. you, you know? Yeah. A, a part of why I constructed that palanquin for the performance was to honor Biddy Mason, who had to walk almost 2000 miles from Mississippi to Utah as an enslaved woman. And it was her job to put up the tents, tear down the tents, but also to care for people because she had been trained in midwifery and the use of plant medicines mm -hmm. from other enslaved women. Mm -hmm. And because she had to walk so far, when I imagined her coming from a planet and seeing the fruits of her labor, she became a millionaire within her lifetime after mm -hmm. she got her freedom. And she owned most of what's now downtown LA when she started mm -hmm. investing in real estate. When I was like, okay, what if she could see my performance? What if she could come downtown in 2022? How would I want her to show up? And I imagine her being carried. But I, I think what I want is for us to be carried in our lifetimes, for that not to have to be an Afrofuturist projection and not mm -hmm. just uh, something that I imagine. So thank you. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your powerful work. I'm thank inspired. You. Thank you. And thank you to Four Freedoms for supporting this project so that it could happen. Thank you. Thank you again. May I ask a question? <laughs> Mateo, I have a question for you. Yes, hello. <laughs> I, I really enjoyed hearing you talk about um, the, the, the forms that, that colonization takes today and uh, how an example of that is gentrification and how that happens within art as well. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've read how you practice harm reduction and how that, that's so important for how you work. Yeah. I'm curious. So often when we talk about abolition and the tenets of abolition, folks think that it's only about prisons and the carceral state and that it's not like a, a framework that we can use and practice every day. Right. I'm curious about as you practice harm reduction and you practice it in like different aspects of your work, what have you learned that a layman could just use on, on a typical day to practice harm reduction? Such a good question, thank you. Um, Hardly anyone draws the connection between harm reduction and grassroots organizing or art organizing. And I think it's very important for us to implement that um, because oftentimes uh, harm reduction, the phrase in and of itself can be perceived as very clinical and was, is often associated with users or those who are in recovery. Uh, and although that is generally the roots of it, the practice in everyday life is very much important for us to think about. Um, harm reduction in everyday life can simply be making healthier choices. Super, super simple, such as I've been eating burgers every single day, but you know what, today I'm not going to get some fries. That is the most simplest terms we can apply harm reduction. But in, in terms of the different spaces that I've been a part of, I've been, I've experienced homelessness. And as a result of that, I did work with unhoused youth for, for several years and including families. And in that regard is simply providing alternatives for them to exist and be comfortable even living in a roof. There are a lot of folks who are not comfortable living inside a roof after they've been homeless for a while. And so what are some ways that we can still encourage them or support them in moving forward in their life while still acknowledging some of the pains that they may have been experienced? Because we don't wanna minimize those experiences because they're very real, no matter how small or big they are. And so when it comes to art organizing, some of the things I think about, well, Art is not exempt from potentially harming people. We've seen that happen. Unfortunately, in Oakland, I was a witness to a fire that burned down a warehouse that a lot of artists frequented. And as a result, a lot of cities pretty much took that advantage and started shutting down a lot of warehouses throughout the US. We saw it happen with Nasiropolis in Denver. We saw that happen also in LA. We saw another one happening in Salt, I think it was Salt Lake something in um, Oakland as well. Like a lot of warehouses, these spaces of care when housing is not affordable, folks were frequenting warehouses as a result to survive. That in and of itself is a form of harm reduction. Rather than being in the streets and being at risk of potentially being assaulted or hurt or just not being in a situation you're not comfortable with, Sometimes these alternative spaces are, are safe havens for us. Mm -hmm. And so we've seen that manifested in different ways. In this case, for freedoms, for the most part, in person, but digital spaces as well, we can find comfort in one another and advocating for our needs. And so for me, harm reduction is just something that does not go away. I wanna make sure that the people who are attending the events that I organize, the programs that I help you know, curate are receptive, loving, intentional, and minimizing any form of trigger. 
So I highly encourage y'all to really look into more into harm reduction and applying that into your personal lives because that is super crucial. And as part of what you've been talking about with that ministry, I'm glad you brought up <laughs> Hershey's work is really centering our rest. What is important to you? How can we care for ourselves? And even in, in practices that we're all involved in. Yes, Absolutely. Ashe, Ashe. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. No, of course. And so I'm curious about, I kind of, I feel like that's a good segue with what you presented, Claudia, with, um, I'm particularly interested in the rules of infinite game. So the four points that you talked about. Play is also a form of minimizing our harm, right? Allowing ourselves to just be exposed to different materials, making things, doodling things, without the expectation that you're going to profit from it. But given that we live in such a capitalist world, a world that is very much rooted in paying for things, including housing, how, I'm curious, there's, there's a tension, I feel like, between play and then, of course, uh, with rest. You know, a lot of folks can't afford to play because they can't afford to rest. As a result, they're working 40 hours a week, 60 hour a week. So how, how can you find a balance between, or how can you encourage folks to engage in play knowing that they may not be able to afford the time to engage in play? Wow. Mateo sounds like a really good research question that we should go find some funding for. <laughs> really of that. I promise you, I don't have a good answer. That's true. But, but I, what I can say is that it doesn't have to be this way, right? Like we, we take it as a foregone conclusion that life is as it is here in the States. Um, and we don't realize that it's actually a hyper-capitalist society that has made a lot of choices that have become so normalized that people think this is the only option. But if you travel, if you spend time abroad, especially in the global South, you will find, oh, you know, like you actually, we don't have to live this way. Everything doesn't have to be productive. Every last minute doesn't have to produce something. Um, hustle culture is really beautiful for some people. It really motivates uh, some folks and other folks, you know, they really struggle and it leads to mental health issues because it's not a natural way of being for everyone, right? Um, except we're all fed these ideas. And so everybody feels like they should be doing something. They should be, you know, working on something. They, um, uh, you know, what Trisha talks about in the NAP ministry is really beautiful and important. And then some people hear it and they're like, what, whatever you know, like I'll sleep when I'm dead. Thanks a lot, Nas. Um, or anybody else who has quoted this. <laughs> <Same>. <laughs> and, but we, in reality, when we're sleeping, we're dreaming, you know, and that's not to say that we're being productive while we're sleeping. What I'm saying is that something amazing is happening, right? And so much, so what I believe messages, information, is happening while we're dreaming. And so we miss out on that when we're so stuck to this idea that we need to be like working all the time. So in terms of being able to afford it, Mateo, which was your real question, um, I actually think that you can play in all sorts of spaces. It doesn't have to be on your off time or the weekend. I think work can be a, a place of play, right? At Four Freedoms, we ensure that people have the opportunity to experience joy in our space because we know that that matters. We care about the human spirit. It's a human-centered um, organization first, everything else second. It just so happens that people are also, you know, better artists or, um, you know, um, better colleagues um, when they have space. Um, and I think that even in places that are not an artist organization, I think of other uh, places of employment that I've been in before, play can exist in there, right? In your like staff meetings or um, even in like trainings, you know, like there should be room for play in every single space. Um, there's this guy named uh, Jeff Harry who talks a lot about the importance of play in work. And, and he takes the position that people, you know, uh, you're more likely to retain employees. Mm -hmm. You're more likely to have a, a more productive workforce, but you're more uh, likely to have, you know, happier employees if you integrate play in the workspace too. So I think that everybody should be thinking about play all the time, not just in your off time or your downtime, but in every space that you inhabit, including class. Yeah. You know. I'm glad you, you brought up, I know we're tight on time, but I'm glad you brought up classrooms and the workspaces, right? Because 
uh, oftentimes play is very much associated to an art practice or leading into or formulating or nurturing your art practice. Uh, we're all, I feel like we're, I would argue that we're all artists in some way and part of that in our entryway is through play. And so I'm glad you brought up dreaming because I've been stressed dreaming about work and I need to get rid of that. So I need to go back <laughs> to dreaming about play because that's really something that we need to incorporate into our daily lives. So I'm thank you so much for, for highlighting those two because I imagine awesome. we have a lot of young younger folks here and workers and art admins and all that. So thank you. Yeah, there's also a lot of information in those stress dreams, Mateo. Oh, no, no. <laughs> I'm blind that. <laughs> so, uh, I, can, I, can I jump in? Yeah. Is there time? So I just want to uh, think about some of the, the language and just kind of the, the metaphoric possibilities of what we're talking about. So obviously, when Nana says, I never sleep because sleep is the cousin of death, He's speaking metaphorically because I now sleep every damn night, right? <laughs> um, so, but he's talking about sleep as a metaphor for being unconscious, which is the same metaphor that the wide awakes are using by calling themselves the wide awakes, which is the same metaphor that is in the common parlance now to when folks say that we are woke, right? Or you're not woke enough, or I'm more woke than that, or however you use it. So, so I, I just, I'm thinking about how we navigate through um, the, this language and what it means that we have this general association with sleep, with being, you know, sort of not, um, not open to or not informed about what's going on around you, you know, dead press, I'm African and I know what's happening is pushing back against this idea that we don't know what's going on in the world, right? Um, you know, so there's there's just so many layers that I think are important. One way that I think about this is that I think art is uh, operates lives in the world of aesthetics, and so if you think about uh, what 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 that means, right? The the opposite of the aesthetic is the anesthetic, the anesthesia. Malcolm X used to say, when you go to the doctor or the dentist, they put Novocaine in your mouth and you're bleeding all over the place, but they put it in there so you can suffer peacefully, right? You know, um, they, you, you, you're, you're getting cut up, but you don't feel it because you're numb to it. So if the anesthetic, the, the anesthesia numbs you, numbs the senses, the purpose of art in some ways should be to wake those senses up, right? It should be an alarm clock, as Anne Bogart and other folks say. It should, should make you see more, should make you hear more, make you, you taste the food, you know, more because it's got them Caribbean spices in it, right? All of that stuff. So I think, I think there's, there's, there's some meaning in those metaphors, not to be lost in the literal understanding of them, but there is some meaning to how we think about it. I think art as a central tool to wake us up to each other's common humanity, our shared humanity and our interconnectedness is I think a part of this conversation that we should bring into the sleep versus, versus woke versus wide awake uh, as, we're, as we're navigating through all of that. Really appreciate hearing you say all this. And I want you to be reminded, Brian, that this is being recorded. So I now have you on the record <laughs> defending this idea of sleep. This is this is sort of an inside conversation, but this is a debate that Brianna and I have been having yeah. for a few years. Yeah. Well, I would just edit Nas and say, I never, you know, abstract sleep because sleep is the cousin of death. Whatever. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Listen up, folks. This is what we're doing next. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, all right. So if you have a burning question, go ahead and put it in the chat. We're going to try to get to it at the end. But next up, we want um, to encourage you all to have some dialogue with each other based on um, some of the infinite playbook questions. So I'm putting the questions in the chat. If you are the type of person who does not like breakout rooms, that's okay. You can still go to your breakout room and just say, I'm staying on mute. You can stay off camera. Just put in the chat, I'm not going to share. I'm just here to, you know, observe. That's fine. Or if you want to jump off now, that's also fine. The provocations are in the chat, but you can do whatever you want once you're in the group, right? Like, no, this isn't homework. Nobody is checking on you. Nobody is certainly policing you. So if the group wants to take it a different direction, go for it. Whoever feels inspired by one of the questions in the chat, lead the conversation. Um, you don't have to take them in order. And again, as I said, you don't even have to answer the questions at all. You can take it a completely different direction. But what we're hoping to do 
um, is to inspire a little bit of a different dialogue than normally happens, um, you know, in breakout rooms in general. So I'm going to go ahead and open the rooms. Do whatever you like. Everything you do is right. So how was that? Put in the chat what that experience was like for you. Meaning, um, did you enjoy it? Was it weird? Was it awkward? Did you guys not talk at all? I joined a group where everybody was really shy, they said. And so it was very quiet when I entered. Um, were there super chatty Cathy's in your group and everyone was talking over each other? Tell us a little bit about what the experience was like. So for those of you just joined, I'm asking folks to share in the chat. What was that experience like? Anything that you say is fine. Awkward is totally fine. Fun is good. Good is good. Mm, weird, totally fine. Don't want to do that again. Also fine, right? No matter what experience you had, no matter how you want to name it, it is welcome. <laughs> oh, I want to hear more from the folks that found the questions confusing. Yes. That's good. <laughs> Does anybody want to either say out loud or in the chat what you did with the confusing questions? Way to go, Courtney. Something that came up in my group, we were curious about um, where is there? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. What did you guys decide is there? Where is it? Well, I, I thought it was kind of cool because it was something that we also recognized when we were talking about play, bringing people mm -hmm. into play. Mm -hmm. um, there doesn't have to be the same place for all of us and it shouldn't be. Absolutely. That's the thing is it's different for every single person, right? Even play means something different for every person. Bringing people into play means something different. What's your trash? You know, for some people, it's like the hater voices in their head. That's the trash. For other folks, it's trauma or baggage. Some folks, it's literal trash. They need to clean their room more, you know? <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. Go. Go. The one that made me giggle when I read it um, was question number three. So how can you know nothing you need to know and everything you need to know? So of course the academy came up, right? But the thing that I shared was I, I had a car accident when I was in high school and so I struggle with retaining information and struggle with memory loss. And so for that, that's me every morning when I wake up, I'm like, how you know nothing you need to know and everything you need to know? <laughs> <laughs> write everything down, y'all. Draw things, write poetry. <laughs> definitely be your own archive. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but it, and it's but there's so many different ways to take that, right? That you know everything you oh, need totally. can be like um each one of us has we're born with all the information we need to manifest our blueprint, right? To like be all the things that we're supposed to be. And if we're in touch with ourselves and our intuition and able to hear that voice, we know everything we need to know. But also, you don't know anything because the world is endless and boundless right and there's no way you'll ever access it all um i'd love to hear um uh, from the folks who felt like the oddly framed questions for example what does it mean to go there thank you christopher what does it mean to go there where where did people land on that question <laughs> yeah i hear that um what did y'all, did anybody have a, oh, he didn't get there. Oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> that means you had juicy discussion before you got to the last few questions. For anybody that did feel like they understood, what does it mean to go there? What was your perspective? Where's Brenna? Brenna, are you willing to speak out loud? Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Would you like to say something about what does it mean to go there? Sure. Um, I just talked about, or we talked about in our group, um, that it can mean like there. We have. Sorry, I'm not very eloquent, but um, 
we have combating voices in our mind about like that can empower us to get to go where we want to be going or they can hinder us or um and we want i think it's our natural instinct to want to um eliminate that fear from our lives but um at the end of the day um i told this story of um just that i heard once about like you are driving on a road trip and this road trip is your life and fear and faith are both in the car and you get to choose who is your co-pilot or who's in the front seat with you so at the end of your life like do you want to say that you let fear um impact your decisions or or like or going for it and so I think we all want to go for it (laughs) yeah Yeah, Brenna what I understood from what you shared is having faith drive that wheel is going there yeah I love that all right anybody else with confusing questions questions that didn't make any sense to you you'd like to hear what somebody else did with it I see Abby wrote in the chat I think Mm -hmm. in response to that question so how to enter and explore that imaginative space as well as that space where we don't know anything while having every piece of knowledge we need yes Abby twice (laughs) Brianna anything interesting happen in your group I mean, there was a lot of interesting exchanges. We we kind of a couple of us talked about uh, enjoying play as a child and being forced into uh, letting go of things that don't generate revenue, generate income. You know, as you get to be an adult, like you know, I used to draw, you know, but that ain't paying me no money. I'm gonna stop drawing. You go, you know put these bottles on these, you know, <laughs> let me jump into the into the machine however I can so I can meet my basic needs, my food, clothing, and shelter. Um, and then, you know, one of the things we, we talked a little bit about was the idea of, of play being central to theater, right? Because ultimately you're working together to make a play. <laughs> and in the process of that, some work goes in, some sweat goes in. You know, one of the points that was made really insightfully is that, you know, you don't do a lot of things and you don't find a lot of joy in, in, in things where you have to do the same thing over and over and over again. But when you're in a play, when you're in theater, you're like somehow searching for this truth, this like something inside of you that has to come out and you do it over and over again. It doesn't feel like work oftentimes because there's a sense of collective joy that's being experienced by, by getting closer and closer to truth or in the example of, of flamenco dancers, right? The crowd at the end when it's a brilliant performance shouts, ole, 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 right? Uh, 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 a residue of the Moors, Black, African, and Asian Muslims being in Europe for 800 years to, to, and teaching about Allah. And so ole, ole is calling out, we see God, we see the, the divinity, we see the most high embodied in artistic practice. And in that idea, uh, we are all elevated and experience joy, ex- experience uh, love, experience ecstasy. Um, and so play, uh, as Carlo Gibran says, you know, the work is love made visible. And so play being imbued with this idea of turning something that would otherwise be, you know, really uh, burdensome, being something light and uplifting because it brings around, it elevates all of those who are involved um, in, really, um, in really dynamic ways. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. We're going to go one or two minutes over the time. Sorry, Laura, we're coming back to you. I just want to give Autumn and Mateo the opportunity to say one last quick word as we close out. In regards to the questions? or no, yeah, just like this whole time that we've spent together in this last hour and a half. Yes. I, I, first of all, thank you all for, for being here tonight. Um, one thing that came up to me is more of this idea of play, but more so that we all have different genres, mechanisms, practices, materials that we use to play with. And so I really appreciate Autumn and Brian for being here, Claudia as well, for just sharing your work. 
And then of course, uh, Laura and the folks behind you, Mocha, for just allowing us to have play through even the Zoom space, despite its messiness. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, I echo that. I'm, I'm full of gratitude for the space we were able to create today and just for us to be able to, to talk about our art and to play with each other. Um, when we got to go into our breakout groups and we were able to have a safe place to, to question, to be curious and to like throw around answers and see what sticks. What I encourage all of you to do is to take this with you beyond this Zoom call. Um, there's power in the 60 something of us taking this and practicing play and joy and civic joy in our own way, whatever we might do for the rest of this week and whenever we interact with people beyond this. So thank you, take something with you and take it with you. I love that, Autumn. Autumn, Mateo and Brian, please put in the chat ways in which people can follow your work, um, whether it's handles or websites. I'm also gonna put the link to purchase Rebel Speak. Um, it will be made available in May. Put your pre-order in now. I think it's super worth it. And also to echo what Autumn just said, especially for those of you who thought the questions or felt the questions were confusing or awkward, sit with them a little longer. I think something might come to you. Uh, all right, with that, Laura, thank you. Close us out. I just wanted to thank everyone for participating and the Four Freedoms team, Autumn and Mateo and Brian and Claudia, um, uh, BYU and uh, Utah State and, and, and all that made this event possible. Um, I, what I have found so meaningful as part of the Four Freedoms process is this emphasis on participation and bringing and allowing all voices to the table. I think it's one of the most powerful elements um, of, of of the practice and I think it's transformative and rebellious and um, and really has um, power to sort of shift conversations in really meaningful ways. So um, like uh, Adam said, to get home and uh, thanks everyone for, for partnering with us today and have a good night. Thank you, have a good night.